So how does an archaeologist then imagine what might have been traded? Uh, you mentioned maybe food provisions well, being one measure of... Food is probably traded, uh, but since it's hard to know, I mean, you know, uh, where did this come from? You could get at it, actually. Uh, if you can get chunks of food that you can do uh, heavy element tests on, you say, oh, this actually comes from somewhere else. We use trade goods to try to get a handle on the uh, size of the, what was traded in, and also the size of the hinterland, where they were getting stuff, and that also therefore gives us a clue about interaction over large geographic areas and the structure of that interaction. Uh, the best evidence we have at Meyer Castle Total is obsidian, which is a volcanic class. We tell, we can identify, volcanic ashes can be identified, or the volcanoes that produce volcanic ashes can be identified by their ele elemental signature. They have different elements in a volcanic, obsidian is volcanic glass, therefore we can source, we can source it. So Meyer and Castapolo get their glass primarily, their obsidian, mainly from Eugene area, but some of it, small portions of it, comes from as far south as Northern California, and some of it comes from east, from central Oregon, none of it from, from, from eastern Oregon, which is full of obsidian, but none of it from there. It's moving north-south. It's not moving from the east to the west, which, which is interesting. It tells us, well, maybe something about the, the shape of the trade networks. Um, though there are suggestions of the trade network going down river to the Dalles, up river to the Dalles, and then on, on, on out east. Um, but it's coming out of the south. There's no obsidian from the north. Um, so that's the main one we have. Also, what, what we look at is what we don't have. So for example, uh, a really important item up and down the coast and east of the Cascades is a shell called dentalium. And dentalium is a, looks like a little horn. Uh, and if you go to the Portland Art Museum in the Native American section, there are a couple of Nez Perce dance dresses which are just covered in obsidian, and not obsidian, but covered in dentalium. So we were expecting to find a lot of dentalium is, is collected off the west coast of Vancouver Island. And so we would be expecting that the, the normal route, if you're going to have dentalium among Nez Perce, it's going to come down the coast and it's going to come up to Columbia and it's going to find its way to Lapway. Uh, we have almost no dentalium in the sites. We have enormous collect, artifact collections. If there were dentalium there, we'd have it. Uh, and there's like three or four pieces. So somehow, it's the sort of thing, I remember when I was a kid, my parents, we lived briefly in, in, in Florida, and apparently, and you couldn't get decent orange juice because all the oranges were leaving. So it's like, the stuff is moving through, and they're training it, but it's not getting siphoned off here. Uh, and we're really startled. So we're, so we're beginning to try to look at what is in upstream. What do they have upstream, and what aren't we finding that would suggest that it's got to be moving through, but it's not getting, getting, getting collected? We do have interesting tantalizing things in terms of trade uh, that we just learned about. We have Chinese ceramics that we think came from a Spanish galleon that wrecked off the coast in the late 1600s. We have little odds and ends from the coast, like a couple of sand dollars. So we know there's stuff coming up, coming up river. We don't have much coming south. We would expect things coming south, but we haven't found that yet. Uh, we'd like to, but we haven't. We know from the trade records that um, the Chinook and communities were very involved in the fur trade. Right. So certainly the treatment of hides, the collection right. at least of hides or provisioning for that trade was ongoing. Is there any evidence of that from the archaeology? So, yes, there's good evidence for, I think there's good evidence for provisioning and there's clear evidence for the, for the uh, participation in the production of goods from the fur trade. In terms of provisioning, uh, another site that we, not Meyer and Catapotal, but a site down at the mouth of the river uh, called Middle Village that was dug by a joint project with Portland State and the National Park Service just down from the Astoria Bridge. And it's occupied in the early fur trade. And it is, the Pauline Major, almost exclusively sturgeon. And the uh, ethnographic record and actually the the logs for the Fort Astoria at the time talks about acquiring bales of sturgeon. So it's a reasonable, it seems like a reasonable inference that they, the folks, the Chinook folks on the north side of the river there may have been provisioning the fort. They were producing sturgeon to provision the fort. 
the clearest evidence we have from just for what was being done here is at Catholic uh, where they were probably producing all kinds for, for trade. Um, the elk hides were, the animals were skinned and the hides were, were, were cleaned and the hair taken off and they were boiled. And then they, the, the hides then became, were used for armor farther north, kind of like a natural Kevlar. Uh, a couple layers of them were, would slow down a musket ball. What we see at Cathopodal, there are a lot of elk at Cathopodal, and the numbers increase after contact, which might be related to this. But what we particularly see is an arch, is a tool that archaeologists call an end scraper, which is a small thumb, thumbnail shaped item which would be hafted and we've had uh, microscopic analysis of the, of the use wear on it and it's from hide working. And what happens is these are present in the pre-contact uh, uh, levels, which means that they were doing this before and then the numbers explode after contact. Uh, and so that what it looks like is that Cathopodal was probably specializing in the production of hides for trading out. Uh, at Meyer, what we see is an increase in woodworking, and so we're wondering, what are they doing? That you know, what, anyway, we, we didn't know that until about the last six months. Uh, but, oh. but anyway, but in terms of so they may be producing something in terms of uh, for the fur trade, uh, wooden items of some kind for the fur trade. For trade, we don't know what they are, but it's clear that Catholic making hides. So I was intrigued by the uh, range of trade items and right. the connections that they suggest. Um, how has this envisioning the Chinookan world um, changed over time, seeing this community as part of a much larger global community? Well, one of the things that we've, I'm not sure this really is, how this answers your question or not. Um, one, of the things, one of the things we've tried to stress is that when people think about the Chinook at contact, they think about them being drawn into a large, the large mercantile world of late, 17, late 18th century trade, where the, suddenly the Chinook find themselves in connection with whole Hawaii and Canton and London, where they weren't before. But it's important to understand that when the fur traders came up, when, when, when uh, Broughton rolled up, rolled up river in 1792, he was entering a very old, trading system that, that extended locally, extended from Alaska on the coast, from Alaska down to Southern California and upstream, and it had connections to the, ultimately to the East Coast. And so, and on the coast, some of those networks were probably 10,000 years old. In the interior, they're not so old, so but 3,000, 4,000 years old. But anyway, so the Chinook uh, along the river were been widely thought of as being the sort of center of this north-south trade network for a very long time. So I'm not sure uh, that it's re-envisioned as, as much as maybe being confirmed, <clears throat> but also a better idea of, a much clearer idea, at least in terms of the past, as to, for example, again, we knew that there were things, fancy stuff coming up river, but the notion of all this production, which may have been the trading and transmit moving around of food, roots, wapato. So that might be part of it, but also just simply the sheer, the sheer wealth of it. So if we had, we have a lot of copper, and we had uh, trace elements done on the copper, wanting to identify trade, you know, native copper, which would be pure copper that was worked before contact. All of our copper, we have like 150 pieces of copper is trade copper. So. We think there was almost no native copper on the river before you know, at contact. Uh, there might have been some, but it was extremely rare. So like dentalium, it's like, where is Because we know there's copper up river before contact. And, well, where's the copper? Where is that? There should be. These are rich sites. I mean, Catholic and I are really <coughs> wealthy, high-status places. There ought to be copper at one, native copper at one or the other. We don't have it. 